буквально перед вашим приходом говорил о книге, новой книге, которая вышла «Путь истинной жизни» пастыря Сандея Деладжа «Факт». И книга это Да, 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 вы видите. И эта книга, что самое интересное, написана была не вами. Может быть, мы принести? Да, показать? может быть, да, да. Ну Сейчас, вот, в принципе, да. мы показываем ее также на экране, пастор, ага. и даем даже э, все фотографии, все тексты. А, вы уже показали? Да, 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 а, да, да, да. И вы знаете, не хочу вас э, ограничивать, ага. потому что мы ждем вас уже и слова, но очень рад, что именно эта книга была написана учениками, которые оценили ваш вклад. So welcome, Pastor Sunday. We were just talking about one of your books, a book that we recommend for you, about your life and about your purpose and your destiny in life. And also just reminiscing about the first time I met you and how in awe I was of you and how you were leading us to the, to the world, to Christ. And even though it was so many years ago, I still consider you as my pastor because you just changed my life. God does everything for us, so I feel like if I left, it would not be grateful to God. So thank you, Pastor Islam. It's good to see all of you. And we're even talking about that today, about you. My pastor, about my leader. And the topic today is more geared towards the pastors, your leaders. What does God expect from us? From us pastors, from uh, us leaders in the church. That's what I want to focus on today. Because from the outside, it looks like it's easy to be a pastor, but it's never that simple. Uh, pastors can have a good start, they can have a good track record, and at the end of the day, they end up becoming like bosses instead of leaders. So, the image of a pastor, of a leader in the kingdom of God. So, the main responsibility of a pastor or a leader is to raise other pastors, leaders, fathers, and mentors. Not to control or keep people in the church or around them. And actually, when I was very much into the pastoral ministry, I had similar temptations. You want people to always be around you. And I was I tried actively to fight against that. I would send people out to start their own churches so that they could enter their purpose. So if you're a pastor today, you're listening to me now, you're a leader of a home group, or you're a leader in a ministry, pay attention to this. You always have these temptations to keep people near you, not to let them go. But that is dangerous. It's dangerous because that means that these people will never enter their life purpose. It's like Pastor Ruslan told me. He met me, he found his purpose, and he was allowed to leave and go into his purpose. Unfortunately, there are other churches where people have repented around the same time as Pastor Sunday, and as new Christians, they were there listening in the pew, pews and 20 years later they're still only in the pews that is what most churches do they care about the members they care about the numbers of the church and they just keep them there and if you find someone who's talented who's strong you want to keep them for yourselves you don't want to let them go if you let them go that means you become weaker and you have to raise other stronger people and so many people don't want to do it and that is the temptation here you want them to remain near you because oh if he misses a service it becomes a huge scandal because he's like oh, he's not with me so we should be pastors of following the word of God let's look at Jesus he had the 12 disciples 
he showed them the Christian life and then would send them off. And then he released everyone when he went back to heaven. So, this is how a heart of a pastor should be. This pastor should be more interested in uplifting the people around him and letting them fulfill their life purpose, not keeping them around them so that they could feel better. So that is the first point that I wanted to bring to your attention. Next. So any father or leader should measure their success by how many people they are able to release into their destinies. So success, you know how we used to measure success before about how many people we had at the church, how many seats were filled, but that's not how we should do it. You need to measure your success about how many leaders you have, how many pastors you have been able to release into the world, and they have their own successful personal projects. Because everybody that comes and comes into contact with me never feels like they need to stay with me forever. They get their knowledge from me, I help them whatever way I can, but at the end of the day, I'm releasing them to fulfill their purpose. There are many different aspects of where these people could be. Because there are all these mega churches, and what's the point if there are a million people in the church, but none of them are a personality, none of them are unique. All of them are just basically church zombies. It's much more important for your church to be full of leaders, full of individuals who love what they do and want to go out and fulfill their passion. So all the pastors of the Embassy of God, I want us to focus on this and help people to be released into their destinies, to help them become stronger, become servants to the world. So next point, for a father and leader should measure his success by how much he is able to rejoice at the success of others and how easily he is able to let them go. So as a pastor, since I've had lots of experience, I just know so many examples where people are upset at the successes of their church members or of their close leaders. They try to pressure them into stay and they get jealous. I don't know if there are any of those in the Embassy of God, but I wouldn't be surprised because they are everywhere. No one is interested in personal growth and success. All, when all they care about is for all you do for their church, all you that you listen to their commands, that you put your whole life into them. But they don't even think about you. You have a revelation, all that stuff that you're still not mature, that you still need to be under my tutelage for about 10 more years, that you're not obedient yet. There are many, many excuses and reasons as to why God does this. And I assume it all comes from these selfish pastors. But if a pastor wants to live according to the heart of God, he will be happy about anything. I will be happy about any of the successes. He will be happy that he has been working, that their members have been working something for something for so long and it has come and become a success. 
That is how it should be. That is how pastors and leaders should be. Because even leaders of home groups, they are even more controlling than the pastors. So if you're a leader, anyone with an authoritative position in the church, you should be happy and let people go. If you're happy that they're grown now, that they're an, an adult in a spiritual sense, you should be happy to let them go. So next points. For a real leader and pastor in the church, he should measure his success by how much he makes people less dependent on him. So it's common where pastors make themselves so important that others can't do anything without him, where everything needs to go through the pastor or no one can do anything without the advice of the pastor. Like, if you want to take out the trash, ask for permission from the pastor. If you want to print something, ask the pastor. If you want to start the home group, did the pastor allow it? If I want to bring offering, no, you need the pastor to allow it first. So if the pastor puts himself in this position where nothing is possible without him, where he makes himself irreplaceable, that's bad. Only God is irreplaceable. It is bad when these pastors only care about this. Um, they should focus on being a help to people, but not become not to let the members be fully dependent on him. He wants to make everyone independent instead of dependent on him. He wants the church to operate even without him. He doesn't want to be a roadblock for his church members. He wants them to only listen to God. It's only on the most important and big matters where he will put himself in. Also, like how Pastor Bosse does it. She doesn't preach there on Thursdays during our mid-service weeks. She always delegates the responsibility to other members and leaders of the church. She wants the church to understand that it's possible to run the service without her. So on Thursdays, it is the responsibility of the church to preach and to run the service. And she'll be there, yes, attending and listening. She just becomes like a church member instead of the pastor. That's just an example of how you, should, you can be a leader according to the kingdom of God. So the next point, a uh, pastor and leader should measure his success by how much his followers and mentees are able to do and accomplish without you, what they're able to do independently. So you should teach them independently. Do you see this picture here? The father is already a fisherman, but he's trying to teach the son. And now the son is holding the rod on his own. This is a good example that I want us as leaders to see. All you need to do is be the example. Want to teach them? Let them do it on their own. There's no need for you to doing, be doing all the fishing in this scenario when you have taught someone else to fish. You need to have that independence, that autonomy. All the pastor should do is try to teach him how to do it, and that's all. 
he does not need to be fully reliant on you. The pastor should be happy that the church members are independent of him. So the next point is a pastor, a leader, a spiritual father. He needs to give his church members these requirements if they if they need it. So a true pastor will always want to help and offer his services to his church members. So number one, his timely advice. If he is a pastor, a leader, he always should be ready to give up his time to listen. Number two, resources. If there are any, if the pastor is able to help provide any resources to his church members, then he should be, he should do so. Number three, financial help or guidance. If there is any opportunity to help financially or through advice, to guidance, that is what a spiritual father, a leader, a pastor should provide. Number four, help them see what they are able to do on their own or how can they can how they can surpass the pastor himself so if he's a true pastor he's not scared of the successes of his church I'm so back home in Africa we have a saying it goes along the lines of uh, parent is bad when the parent does not want your his kid to surpass him. So as I was growing up, they were always praying over me to surpass them, and they consider it as an embarrassment if their kids do not surpass them. I think that is a good sign if your members are surpassing you and are performing well. Number five, you should be a good role model. He should be a good example showing his church members how to act as good Christians both in the church and in society. Number six, he should be a leader in vision and direction. Next, he should instill confidence into his church members that you can do it, go with faith. And then there are others who don't act that way. They try to sow doubt into their minds instead of the opposite. Any leader from God will always motivate you and give you confidence, not the opposite. So today I tried to keep the sermon short so that we could answer some questions. Because on the last anointing question, I wanted... I asked the question, what do you want sermons or do you want me to just answer questions? So people wrote us and they've given a list and they couldn't decide. Many people wanted a sermon, many people wanted answers to questions. And some people even said both. So I think the administration said we should try and have both. So we should have answers to the questions and a sermon. So if there are any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you for that sermon. It was concise, but it was amazing. People can rewatch this and see the slides. So, first question. And I know that all the, oh, your answers will be amazing to these questions. So question number one. How can you find a balance between offering honor 
to your pastor and then just trying to please your pastor more than God? Well, that is a that's a very good question. So honor, it's of course it's necessary, but you shouldn't go over overboard. You shouldn't change who you are just to, in quotes, honor the pastor. Because if you can already see that you, if, you, if you think you're doing too much, that's already bad. You should just act like yourself. So I think as a pastor I should be respected. But of course I'm going to respect you too. If I am to be honored, then I will honor you too. Once it's headed in a one-way a one -way relationship, that's wrong. For example, as a pastor, I can teach you something, but I can also recognize that I can learn things from you. If I only teach you and I don't learn anything from you, if I don't listen to you, and we can't even have a conversation, or come to you for professional help outside of the church, I'm not a specialist in every area. Of course, you have a job outside of the church, so I can learn from you as well. That is the type of balance that you should have. Because honor should not only be to your pastor, it should be to your friends, to everyone around you, to your neighbors. Thank you, Pastor Sunday. Next question from our lovely brothers and sisters. What can I do if I honor my pastor and leader, but I don't agree with all of his teachings? Hmm, that's part of life. That's a normal part of life. And I think for you as well, you, sh you wouldn't agree with all of my views. So to honor someone doesn't mean that you need to blindly believe everything that I say. I can make mistakes, I can say something wrong. You guys aren't zombies. It's only zombies who swallow everything and not listen to anyone else. They don't use their head to think. You need to turn on your head. Always have critical thinking. Not to be foolish just because you're in church. The same way as you live in, in, in your home, at your work, you're analytical there, so you shouldn't stop being analytical at the church. Don't be blind when it comes to the church just because it's full of pastors. Me being a pastor doesn't mean that I'm not human, and as human, we all make mistakes. It's impossible to not make mistakes. So I am a sinner as long as I'm human. So if I make mistakes, it's, so it wouldn't be fair if I made a mistake and nobody told me about it. Then I'll think that I was actually right when I was wrong. So it's not good if you honor this pastor and he's wrong so then he'll continue believing that he's right when he's wrong so there was even a situation not long ago when coronavirus began and some people started some pastors started to say you should not take the vaccine you can't take the vaccine and so of course people asked me and I had about 10 people come visit me and all 10 were against the vaccine. And of course it would be easier for me to just say, oh, okay, you guys don't want it then you shouldn't take it. But because I was an honest person, I had to tell them no. I know that many people tell you not, many pastors tell you not to take the vaccine. But I believe that you need to. This is your life. Why would you risk your life because of this? And you shouldn't spread the danger to others. Also, if you want to travel, I mean, if you want to stay in your own city for the rest of your life, then sure. 
if you want to go on vacation, on a business trip, they'll ask, do you have a vaccine? So you need to be serious with this. And if worst case, what happens with the vaccine? You might die, but we're not scared of death. But, you know, I was actually wanted to be one of the first people in Ukraine to take the vaccine. But if I'm going to be honest, this, this vaccine that was brought to Ukraine, I don't trust it too much because it's come from India. It doesn't have such a clearance rate like this one that's come from India. It only has about a 50 effective rate ex compared to the other vaccines who have a 90% rate. So just because I say this, that I think that we should have, we should take the vaccine. People can still have their opinion. I need to respect their opinion, of course. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean that I'm a dictator. I'm not Stalin, where everybody must follow anything that he says. We are just humans. So, the next question. How can you build your relationship with your pastor or leader when I struggle to build relationships with friends? So, you shouldn't try too hard to just create this relationship. You should just try to be closer to the person. You, need, you should just do what's right, but, and the relationship will grow after. You shouldn't tell yourself, I need to build this relationship by force. You should just do what's right. If the pastor teaches you something, then listen to it. If he gives you any homework, then do the homework. Just live your life and you will see that the pastor will notice you. He'll notice how you're so important, how you're so focused, and the relationship will grow. So next question. My relationship with my pastor is now loved and liked by my spouse and by my family. What should I do? So of course you should be smart. You should take into consideration the views of your spouse. So if you are a wife and your husband sees that if you are more kind, if you are more affectionate to your pastor than you are to the husband. If he sees that you honor him much more than you do him at home, and when you see him, you start um, almost kissing the ground between below your pastor's feet, then uh, just try not to be so demonstrative in your respect for your pastor. Because remember that um, in the family, the husband is supposed to be like Christ is to the church. If you, if you treat him like something you take for granted at home, but you are, all, but you are uh, running to your pastor whenever you see him, then I, I can understand your husband's jealousy. What do you do if people are respecting the pastors of your church, but not the leaders of the church? Well... First of all, leaders should res earn respect. It shouldn't come at them auto automatically. Um, if you f feel that the leaders of your church have not earned your respect, you should still remain humble. You should still do your best to respect everyone, pastor and everyone else. But if the leaders are acting in a way that makes it easy for you to respect your pastor, 
Meanwhile, you just don't find yourself respecting your leaders. Well, that means they haven't earned the, the authority that they have been given yet. So let them approve themselves and then you'll start to respect them as well. Thank you, Pastor. Here's the next question. What do I do if I accept and, and honor my pastor, but I'm not really... I'm not really um, happy about his his um, spouse, and I don't really accept her. Well, okay, the, that's not your spouse, and that's not your pastor. Your pastor is your spouse, uh, is your pastor, and your and his spouse is his spouse. Um, well, you don't need to assume that the pastors uh, that the pastor's spouse is the same status of the of the of the pastor himself you know um, there are some pastors that even have unbelieving spouses i mean they are separate people and you need to and you need to tell them apart some churches think that if there's a pastor who's married, then the spouse is also automatically a pastor. No, not automatically. She also needs to prove herself. She also needs to show uh, through her uh, character, through her actions, that she is worthy of respect. You don't have to honor her, just be, honor the spouse, just because uh, the spouse is married to someone. So honor and respect don't come out of nowhere. Of course they don't. They're earned. Next question. What do you do if I, as a leader, um, honor my pastor and honor um, and honor his his team? But but there are people uh, uh, in my home group who um, are irritating me, and as a leader, I cannot um, exclude them from the home group. Um, that's because you have not earned. That's because you have not earned. Um, that's because you have not earned. Um, that's because you have not earned their respect yet, um, and you need to be showing the fruits of the spirit, humility, um, faithfulness, goodness, in order to earn the respect of those group members that are irritating you, um, and to prove to them that you are who you said you are. If you've done all of that and the, the, your and your group members still don't respect you, then just live on. Um, pay attention to those who accept you and are ready to be guided for uh, guided by you, and live on. Those who aren't ready to be guided by you, let them live their own lives. What should I do if I am the member of a church? and I want to start a ministry, but I'm not sure my pastor will entrust me with that ministry. Well, in that case, you should write a letter to your pastor. You should uh, suggest to him what you want to do. And you should wait for his answer or make an appointment with him and let him know what it is you want to do. So the pastor can tell you what it is um, he suggests you do. Only after that you can think about these things, because right now you are um, coming to conclusions and you are assuming that the pastor will say no. He hasn't said anything yet, but you're already making assumptions and you're scared of what he will, of how he will respond. You have to face him head on, come to him and have an open conversation with your pastor so that you can start that ministry. Next question, how can you be in peace with everyone if everyone in the if everyone in the church is of different statuses, social status and different backgrounds? People are different everywhere. Um, people have different statuses, but we have one world. The world is the same for everyone. If you have and if you have peace in your heart, then you will be able to have peace in any environment. If you have peace in your heart, then you will treat everyone in the world and outside of it um, with the same peace. Because this is a peace that transcends all understanding and it will just pour out of you whether you want it to or not. It doesn't, it shouldn't really matter the status that you, of people that you meet. What do I do if my leader 
is younger than me and I could be his and I could be his mother so it's hard for me to look at a spiritual leader or as someone who was older than me in the spiritual sense well you just said that he is younger than you in age right but your age has nothing to do with your spirit because your age is the age of your body of your flesh meanwhile the spiritual world is separate from that so you just let yourself know how old are you spiritually that's like the person that when i was starting the church i was 27 and there was a woman who was 38 and she had the same problem she just couldn't look at the young me as uh, someone who had uh, more experience because she had more life experience but then later she told me herself that she had a dream that she sees herself in the spiritual world and um, I'm like a giant and she f feels like a three-year-old and through that dream she was able to humble herself in the same way you should uh, look into your spirit and say, and find how old are you spiritually do you have the same spiritual experience as your leader if you look at yourself not through your physical age but through your spiritual age then um, that should help you but if you think that you are spiritually as mature as your leader then prove it have bear the same fruits as your leader has in at his age then you then one can understand why you feel that your leader can not surpass you but unless you haven't um unless you have achieved the same results as your leader it doesn't matter how much of a giant you think of yourself a friend you are still spiritually a child so just um, see in, see for yourself um, what's your spiritual age next question how do you uh, build a, a relationship of trust between a leader and his team well you have to read a whole book in order to understand that um, I do have a book like that called Dream Team um, and I suggest everyone finds it and reads it. I have a whole book dedicated to that question. So, and the answer to this question is found in Pastor Sundia Dalaj's book, Dream Team. Next question, how can you avoid rivalry in your teams? Well, you won't be able to avoid it since even Jesus wasn't able to avoid it among his disciples. People wanted to be on his left side, on the right side of God and on the left side of God. They were trying to find out who was the greatest among them. <laughs> and that is a rivalry among the disciples. <laughs> Uh, even when, even by reading the Gospels, we can see which disciples were rivaling each other m m most. There will always be rivalry, but the most important thing is that it's not destructive, and that it's not this kind of flat, prideful, um, and um, conflicting, conflicting rivalry. There will always be some rivalry, but instead of letting it manifest in fights and scandals and and um, splits, let people um, have healthy competition and let people learn over time to honor people and see each other as, see um, your neighbor as higher than you. What should I do if it's hard for me to be open with my leaders and pastors if they are of the opposite sex? You don't have to be open with people of the opposite sex if that makes you uncomfortable. Find the leader that is of the same sex so you don't, ha you don't have to change your personality. I'm not telling you to leave your church. I'm just saying find the assistant or find someone in the church that can be a spiritual mentor to you who's of the same sex. 
All right, next question. Why is it easy for some people to build relationships with their pastors and leaders, but for others it's a trial? Because, well, that depends on the personality that a person has. There is a word called extrovert. And the extroverted people are very happy to talk to people and they are very naturally sociable because they gain energy from being around other people. There's also the word introvert and introverts hold everything inside themselves. So it's not so easy to them to um, build um, outward relationships that require a lot of communications. And um, it drains their energy to be around a lot of uh, uh, lots of people, and everyone has their own personality. Everyone has their own special traits. Second of all is time. How much time have all these people spent together? If someone has known the pastor for a long time, compared to a person who has come to the come to the church recently, of course they will have a difference in relationship. Second of all, people are in, in different stages of development. In, internally. If a person has developed himself to make sure that he becomes more talkative and learns not to be shy in front of a, a crowd, then he will have an easier time than someone who's just starting to work on their um, on the traits holding them back. How um, am I supposed to respect a leader and uh, treat them with um, honor without paying attention to their human side and without paying, paying attention to their sinful side. Remember that we come to church not to gaze at other humans and that the fact that your pastor has a human sinful side is just another reminder that you have a human sinful side. If you understand, I too am not perfect. If you see that where your um, leader is weak and where he sins, then you need to say, okay, let me take this example as an anti-example and say, I will not be like this. Learn from his mistakes. Learn from, um, learn from his weaknesses so that you don't uh, get tempted in the flesh uh, like he did. We will always be sinful as long as we're here on this earth. So just use every situation in order to better yourself and correct yourself. Thank you, Pastor. The next question, if there is a member of the church that wants to uh, discuss a very sensitive to topic with, with, the, with the pastor in front of the whole church, would that be uh, dishonoring to the pastor? Well, if this is a question that is uh, concerning the whole church, then there's nothing wrong with discussing it in the assembly of the church. If you are taking a sensitive topic uh, concerning the personal life of a pastor, well, maybe you should come up to maybe you should come up to your brother in Christ and talk to him personally. If he doesn't do anything, um, bring someone else from the church w with the, uh, you to confront them. Only on the third time can you do it in the whole assembly of the church. At least that is what the New Testament tells us do, what to do. How do we understand uh, the parts of the Bible that says a uh, disciple cannot be higher than its teacher, even though Jesus said that his disciples will do greater things than he has done on earth. I think that Jesus said that so that his disciples wouldn't drown in pride and they think that, oh, I'm so cool, I'm the disciple of the Messiah. No, it's for people to know that there is a certain limits to human development. And as for the second one, as I was speaking of earlier, every parent wants their ch child to surpass him and to be better than him. Um, and Jesus also wanted his disciples and wants all his children in order to um, and to do things greater than him. However, Jesus never said that we could become greater than him. He said, you will do greater things than I have done. Things, things you will do. We can never become greater than Jesus Christ. We can make bigger and greater actions, but we will never be greater than our origin, Jesus Christ. 
So practically, even if you achieve something more than your teacher, that doesn't mean that you should um, lose your honor and respect for your teacher, right? You shouldn't think of yourself as greater than anyone else. What should I do if I trusted my, if I trusted my leader with a I trusted my leader with a secret, and I, then I find out that my leader mentioned this to my um, pastor. So I discussed it in private with him in the home group, and I heard that he discussed it with the pastor. Well, I instead we should make sure that the conclusions are not jumped to, because there might be another way that the pastor found out. And um, it's very important that you come up to your leader and say, hey, what happened? What happened here? What's going on here? And he can say, hey, um, this is what happened. And by clearing up the possible misunderstanding, things might become a bit easier for you. All right, thank you, Pastor. Here's the next question. Uh, this is such an interactive method. It's been a long time already. Uh, this is a question of for the last harvest. Harvest. What pas This is a, like a strategic uh, question. It's the t it's time for the last harvest. What kind of pastor should exist during these times in order to collect and reap the final harvest during the end times? during the time of crises, during the time of cataclysms, during the final harvest, what should, what should pastors be, what kind of pastor should there be? Pastors need to be ready for these situations and they need to be educated, they need to be um, enlightened, they need to be ready to use the latest technologies, including the internet. People who know how to do live streams, people who are, people who use um, social media, people who uh, have in, who have used a lot of self-education and are able to speak the same and are able to speak, reach all generations. Thank you so much, Pastor. You know, the, the, the time just flew by. These were some serious questions, though, you know. Yes, these were some very uh, deep questions, and you gave us some very, very voluminous answers. You gave us some... You gave us some good um, answers to the basic questions of being a pastor, basic questions of being a pastor, of being a leader. So I have one more question for you. Do you think, pastor, that all of the gifts, all the spiritual gifts uh, that are received are received, are given by a pastor or a leader should not uh, be in the exclusion, should not exclude the gift of fatherhood? Because on your slide you talked about being like a proper father, a spiritual leader. Even when I was in Belarus um, and I was in the church, I remember that that was my ultimate revelation, that a big part of ministry is that spiritual fatherhood. The last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, it's written that uh, Elijah will come as in someone in the spirit of Christ and will return the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. So that was the prophecy about Jesus in the last verse of Malachi, and at least half of Jesus' sermons are built on the, f on the foundation of my Father uh, and I, my Father and I, my Father in heaven. And we 
need to listen to, and we need to take that example to build a similar relationship between pastors and parishioners. So for you as a pastor, the truth about fatherhood became a became a f fundamental part of your movement. So you could be like a boss, you could be like a director, but that's not exactly what um, God called us to. That will be like a business instead of uh, the Church of the Living God. Thank you, Pastor. You said you wrote a book. How do I find it? Uh, look, at, look up Pastor Sunday in Russian on Facebook. And I'll show you the site. On the Russian Facebook, you can, you can find all of your books and read uh, previews and and can read uh, your material about fatherhood and about discipleship. Um, the true facts of your life journey. The facts of how you've influenced people's lives. And I think this book is a great testimony from pe the people that you've impacted themselves. Um, this is an unusual work because this is because usually authors write some autobiography, but the people around them who have been influenced by their work um, writing a work about a certain person is a little bit more unusual. Often, people forget the importance of God's gifts because of all the information they can get from their pastor. But this book, with all of its testimonies, is very important and documents all of the positive impact of fatherhood on it. At 23, you become a pastor. You've been a pastor for 23 years. We've had a good relationship throughout that time. The Embassy of God has always been a family. And I've never felt a desire not to be in this family, despite the challenges that we may have gone through. And I also would like to say in your presence that I would also like to write down my testimonies. I won't lie, I don't like to write, but it's great to see this work that's usually written when a person dies, when Miles Monroe died, you wrote about how you missed him, his friendship and discussions with Miles Monroe. And, but here's the fact that even while you're alive, people are grateful to you. And Praise the Lord that, that Satan is not able, people, people are able, to, uh, Satan can drown people in information and make them forget about all the good things churches and pastors bring, especially during this COVID period where there's excuses to dissociate from the church. Yeah, exactly. So... Can we also be good disciples and write something like this? Um, I think these are facts that will help 
that will help people know um, true facts about what um, the gifts of God a person has brought into my life. Thank you so much. Uh, bless you all. Everyone who is watching us online, um, I want to encourage you. I want you to uh, have a good day and we pray for all needs that God is going to solve with his hand and he is going to solve sicknesses, he is going to solve family problems in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, we'll see you later, Pastor. Thank you very much. Thank you that you spent time with us, that you prayed for us, for your word. We're going to let our dear Pastor go now. All the best to you, Pastor, and your family. Uh, okay, goodbye. So, 